sometime in the mid nineties or early nineties or something, I, you know, I went to sleep in my house with the TV turned on and I woke up at two in the morning, the TV was flashing this white light. And I opened my eyes to this flashing and realized I was looking at a rock concert on TV. It was just blinding flashing lights and billowing plumes of smoke and belching flames and explosions. And I was like, yeah, then now that's a fucking rock show. And then wait, wait, that's us. <laughs> <laughs> But I guess I'm kind of gonna gonna keep it a little bit Texas, just because you guys are from there, and I kind of feel like even when I was a kid, I was aware that you were from Texas when I first heard these records. Um, uh, can Paul? Can you tell me about San Antonio and how it affected your outlook as a musician? <laughs> Well, I always thought San Antonio was a really boring place to grow up. And so I couldn't wait to leave and see San Antonio in the rear view mirror. And so as soon as we got that chance, we were, we were gone. It was, there was no place to play in San Antonio for the butthole surfers. Did you, now I, I read that Chet Atkins was a, was like a guitar inspiration for you. Were, were you playing guitar as a kid and how did you leave it and how did you come back to it as a butthole surfer style? Yeah. My, you know, I saw Elvis Presley when I was five. And so I talked my dad into buying me a guitar. And so he bought me a little $5 guitar from Mexico that <laughs> didn't even have six strings. And I played that enough to where when I was six, he bought me a regular six string guitar. And then I saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show and had to have an electric guitar and he, obliged and got me an electric guitar but yeah I, you know i took lessons as a kid and lessons in junior high and played in garage bands in high school and and then stopped playing in college and didn't pick it up again until after college when gibby taught me into rehearsing with his new band i'm really curious because uh you know, i'm such a fan of your guitar playing and there's something so uh musical and guitar-y about it i guess for lack of a better word that 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 even as a kid i, I i'm I, I first heard the pcp uh record and it was the most it was just the best guitar lines i'd ever heard and it sounded like somebody who knew how to play guitar and was fucking it up in the funnest way and so i'm just wondering in these garage bands and stuff, were you like a hot shit guitar player? Were you really, did you love playing guitar? Was it, was it like a thing that you loved to do? Yeah. You know, it was a lot of fun. When you're in high school, that's about as fun as it gets. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, I, I, I didn't have the, I didn't have the stamina to, to practice a whole lot. So I, I never became a, a gifted or accomplished guitar player, but I, I learned a little bit and, and just use what I had. Got it. Um, but so, so, so you lose interest in it, and then is it visual art that 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 comes next? As far as you being stoked about something? Yeah, you know, I thought, you know, I thought maybe I could become the next Pablo Picasso, and so I studied art and uh, realized I didn't really have the stamina to put in the the necessary hours for that either. It was just all about meeting meeting chicks. <laughs> um, so. So you meet Gibby and Gibby's got the idea to start making music. You know, it's, I, we listened to a lot of punk and new wave records when we were attending college together and I graduated a year before he did. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I went to work in a lumber yard and then when Gibby graduated, he got a job with Pete Marwick and Mitchell, which was the biggest accounting firm in the world at the time. And uh, that didn't last very long, but uh, I think he wanted a band as a way to escape from the world of accounting. Mm. And so he'd come, he'd come into the band practice every day in his suit and tie from work. And he'd strip down to his underwear and start singing through a toilet paper tube. And that kind of spilled over into the live show. That idea of, of using things that, 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 that like just sort of shitty things that were a, a, around, I don't know that, 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 that just, that, that struck me right away when, I, when, when I was a kid. So, um, about, about you guys, um, so I guess the 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 next question is I've been dying to know this. Who wrote these bass lines? Like because there's such a sound and these bass lines made such there's such such a thing. And I was wondering if, if that was you or Gibby or, or was it whoever whatever bass player was on hand. 
it depends on the song. You know, Gibby, Gibby did come up with uh, quite a few bass lines that were the basis for songs, and I came up with a few. And the 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 bass lines were to me again. I'm I, I could just remember being a kid, and you know, I had grown up on classic rock and and stuff like that, and there was. The, the, it was those bass lines that just jumped out at me, and it seemed. And and then and I'm I'm curious if you guys if there were any bands that you particularly loved when you were doing Butthole Surfers. Yeah, like I'd, immediately the Meat Puppets come to mind. You know, I can remember before there was a Butthole Surfers. Uh, either Gibby or I went out and got a copy of a, a Meat Puppets seven inch single on vinyl uh, called Out in the Gardener and in a car or something like that. Yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in a car, yeah. It sounded like a train wreck. It was just, you couldn't, it was so just ridiculous. And, and uh, of course we loved it. And that was kind of like, gee, we could, we could do that. <laughs> Did, I remember uh, a, a reading in a Me Puppets uh, interview in some punk fancy and, and uh, Kirk would, Chris, or, or, or Kirk says, punk rockers are easier to piss off than their parents. And, and 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 I kind of, you know, like like it's true, right? I know. <laughs> and, and it felt like you guys went right, we're, we're 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 there right away in that regard, you know. Um, uh, so did you see the Meat Puppets after you saw this? Like, did, did did their live show make an impression on you as well? Yeah, they played in San Antonio, opening up for Black Flag, and uh, did people just hate them? watching their bass amp, you know, they would pull their own amps over just out of carelessness and it was just bedlam. And it seemed like the whole thing was about to break and, and end, but they made it through a whole show. <laughs> Were there other, what was So, so me puppets are jumping off point. They're inspirational. Is there, and, and any other uh, inspirations from, from the jump? Well, we, like, uh, we probably got like a uh, SPK or otherwise known as surgical penis clinic. Wow. And, uh, I heard Chrome for the first time through you guys. I spent oh, the night yeah, at Chrome. one of y'all's places and Chrome was playing. But also I was really impressed when you told me early on that you kind of, in a way, taught yourself to play guitar by playing along the Grand Funk Railroad. And and, and, and you, would, you would have these classic rock riffs that were just so unique in punk rock. No one was doing that. But I mean, but, but you could do it. You, 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 could, you could play like, like, uh, like Mark Farner. <laughs> to me at least and it's like yeah, man I, this is really cool i mean this- it was identifiable at yeah i i really well said because same you know it was like well yeah this is th- these it's like this motherfucked classic rock field but like so fucked up you know <laughs> like 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 and uh, i think it was a benefit to to take off from playing the guitar for the four years that i was in college because i was just full of that you know cover band you know 12 bar blues electric guitar stuff that I needed to just flush that out of my brain entirely and start over with a fresh attitude. So that, that, that blowing out of, of of all the old habits or whatever, it's, it's just, that's just how the buttholes hit me, you know, at whatever the fuck I was, it was 14. So it was like 1984, 1985, you know, like, like it was that thing where like, I really like classic rock. I like Led Zeppelin and stuff like that. And then I was starting to listen to other stuff. And then when I heard the buttholes, it was so like, doing rock better and, and also destroying it you know but also there's like there was clearly there's so much music in it you know what i mean I, I and and i'm curious like one of the things i had written down was like were you aware that your records were hitting like like that these really very specific you know clearly like you guys came up with the language and you came up with a sense of humor and a whole fucking thing and a sound and then were you aware that it was hitting elsewhere that it was hitting outside of texas and stuff did did, did you feel it at any point was there a moment where like holy shit like this no huh? <laughs> I mean, we, were, we were pretty out of it and you know, by then we were kind of living on the road and just thrilled to death if we could make enough money to, to get gas money out of town and maybe a case of beer and a bag of weed I, I do recall when when the first EP came out. We were in Seattle. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, we, we were kind of. I think we had one show, and like we were crashing at uh, at friends' former girlfriend's house <laughs> apartment for, for like an entire month. I think. I mean, she she was a really patient person. She's a saint. Anyway, the, the record, the first EP, finally came out. And I recall like calling up the radio station saying, "Oh yeah, do you have the uh, Buttle Surfers?" And I, I listened by the radio like just wanting to hear it. He was like, "Yes, 
Okay, we're <laughs> legit. It's on the radio now. Right. It was so exciting. Yeah, I mean, because I, I mean, again, I just I, like in New Jersey, these frick, there was like a fucking atom bomb just among like friends of my like like this guy Frank Longo, who's the smartest kid in my school, and he was the most talented artist, and he had, had painted Ace Fraley on the back of his jacket when he was like nine, and it was like perfect, you know, and he was just like the fucking coolest kid, and he was the guy who gets into hardcore and punk or whatever, and then he plays me this record, and it it just landed so so easily it, it, you know like it, it it was it was really like a like an invitation to participate in something and it, and like it, it had that kind of magic where you felt like these guys got you but they're also really scary <laughs> you know what I mean? like there's this thing and then also the the i'm curious like when when you first started playing sets did you have all these songs written did you how how together was it well, we had enough songs, you know, to play a maybe a thirty-minute set or something like mm-hmm. that, and and uh, we didn't even think about making a record. But then after a while, it was just like, hey, you know, we we really should make a record, and you know, that's then then we moved out to California and and we met Jello Biafra and and landed with Alternative Tentacles, and then we came back to Texas, and then we hooked it up with King, who was the big. Uh, the big prize for us to land King is the drummer. <laughs> Did you all know each other? Did you know King as a drummer? Not, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> but did y'all? I think the, I think the only reason I joined the band or I was invited to join the band is because I was willing to do it. Uh, <laughs> they, they they had so much trouble keeping keeping around drummers, and I think I saw the 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 show before I joined where this really good drummer, I mean, a really skilled drummer got hit in the head, but he was not punk rock. He got hit in the head with a beer bottle. And th- the band was great. They were fantastic. And I, I saw the poor drummer get hit with a beer bottle. You could tell, like, oh, boy, TikTok, his time is nigh. He's he's not going to stay in the band too long. And by that point, Phil, Phil Paul, and Gibby were, were hanging out in Austin a lot more. And I let them know, you can hit me with a beer bottle. It's it's fine. I, I I, I want to be in your band. And I think just the sheer fact that I had enthusiasm, I think that was enough f- for me to be in the band. Because actually, I only had two drums to my name. I mean, I, I was barely a drummer. But uh, that, just the fact I was willing willing to be a drummer was enough for them. <laughs> did, was were the Again, also, your approach to playing drums, I think, was, you know, you know, felt extremely fresh. What, what, was it your idea to, to, be, to do the standing up? thing or did what was had, had that already been established yeah well my, my my previous band uh in fort worth uh was called the hugh beaumont experience and we were a bunch of high school kids and at first you know we wanted to be a you know we were a punk rock band so we were playing the sex pistols this is like our singer saying he's 15 years old singing with a british accent because that to us was was what punk rock was um eventually about a year later we saw you know hardcore bands like oh this is punk rock now so it all, it all got to be really fast so we just took the same song and just played them twice as fast well we had one show where i left behind my uh kick pedal i didn't realize it until several days later and when i called the club they had no idea what i was talking about there was no way i could afford another one so it's like huh but then i thought heck the, we're, we're just playing hardcore songs they're just fast it's just um, bah, um, bah, um, bah, um, bah. I can do that on two drums. Uh, you know, screw it. Uh, uh, so I was just—I was kind of like a wind-up monkey in a way, just banging on my two drums. And uh, but it was liberating. It was fun, and that's really all you need for that genre of music. I think right around then, I, I know the Hugh Bomb Experience opened up for uh, the Bottle Surfers when they had uh, when they came back to Texas, and that's where I began befriending the band. I think they thought that I was I was comical enough to to qualify to be in the Bottle of Surfers. So, so so there you go. King was the one that had recording experience. I mean, we owned his his single, the Hugh Bobon Experience, and uh, so the <laughs> idea of having a an accomplished studio drummer in our band was was really exciting. <laughs> Legit, yeah, legitimizing. <laughs> and we you know we we couldn't get people to play drums for us. That you know we went in to make our first record. And we didn't have a drummer. It was it was just Gibby and I. And there was uh, a drummer for another band that was willing to help us out for a couple of songs. And I think he played on uh, the Shaw Sleeps and Lee Harvey's Grave and something else. 
And uh, we were trying to talk him into playing some more, and he wouldn't do it. And then we were like, uh, we were going to, we were recording the song Hey, and all of a sudden there was a knock on the door at this, you know, terrible dive studio that we were recording at in San Antonio in a CD part of town. And this guy at the door uh, comes in and says, Hey, I heard y'all, you know, from the street, you know, I'm a drummer from New York. Can I drum on a song? We were like, Hell yeah, sure. And, And so we, you know, we showed him the song and he needed to record every drum separately. He couldn't just record the drums and the take. So he started off doing a track of hi hat and then a kick drum and then a snare. So he was mentally ill or something. <laughs> when he and then when he was done, he walked out the door and we never even knew his name. And and he's a drummer <laughs> on our first record. And then uh, then King agrees to be in the band and that was just super exciting. You know, it was like, all right, our search for a drummer is over and and I can remember the excitement to, in picking King up from the bus station with his two drums. And I, I was using borrowing my dad's Suburban to pick him up and take him back to the studio where we were already in session. And then I ran out of gas with <laughs> King in the car. And I was like, oh, he's not going to want to play with us after this. It was just so embarrassing. <laughs> then he, you know, he didn't say anything. So I was like, all right, he can deal with this. You know, he can deal with anything. Truth be told, like they, they were my favorite band. So I kind of right. won the uh, punk rock lottery that I got to join my favorite band. I mean, back then, uh, th- there were so few punk bands in Texas. You, 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 could, you could count them on maybe two hands. I mean, but uh, uh, Buttle Surfers were were my favorite, certainly one of my favorite Texas punk bands, along with the Big Boys and the Dicks and Stickman the Reagans. Those bands were just hallowed to me. So uh, when the buttholes needed a drummer, it's like, oh man, I so want to do this. And because because my previous band was in the process of breaking up, so it's like, man, uh, I've crept in like communism and uh, <laughs> stuck around, <laughs> unlike communism. Well, wait, I, I, I don't <laughs> want my analogy is there, but uh, <laughs> but what? yeah, but, but they were my favorite band, and and I've I've always kind of had two minds with with the Buttle Surfers because I've been with the band for a few decades now. But I'm still I'm still like a fanboy at heart, you know. I'm still like That's the awesome. big fan of whatever Gibby and Paul are working on. So it's like, yeah, I'm 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 happy to just be around. I'm happy with the that, uh, the, the participation ribbon. <laughs> that's cool. I, I I I mean I would say that, I mean it's e- easy to venture that that has something to do with the awesomeness of the butthole surfers is that respect and enthusiasm and being fucking psyched to play with each other, you know. Like which again there was always this electricity whenever I'd see you guys. Um when when you brought Teresa in when did the double drum thing lock yeah i mean t- 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 teresa just nailed it from the get go and it really opened my mind up as to what drums could be because yep. up to up to that point until teresa joined i was still doing just the two drums like kick snare kick snare kind of thing teresa came in brought in nothing but but toms two two rack toms two floor toms and just made everything heavier and denser. And she and she nailed it from the get go. I mean, she was playing a hard, she was playing harder parts on a on a weird kit that she never quite you know, played before, like this toms only. And she just nailed it. She was just a natural, you know. So she was one of a kind, absolutely. How do they, so? So I, I kind of want to get into the recording because we're talking about these the, these records that kids can hear now for the first time, and you know, we're, I'm 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 hoping that people who are listening are people who maybe not be familiar with you guys, um, and, with, with the Butthole Surfers. So I um, how when did you get into the sound of the the the, the records struck sound so distinctive? Did, did how I guess did you all have any idea what you're doing or rather I guess that's a dumb question did you have any intention about what how you wanted the records to sound no cool just <laughs> simply no I mean <laughs> <laughs> we were we were into dada and nihilism and right. into not thinking about what we were doing it was all random and whatever came out was good enough with us and mm-hmm. there it that was the only thing that was on purpose was our lack of purpose. Mm-hmm. Who drew the clown on 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 the PCP record? I did. Thank you. We need we needed an album cover that day, and you know I had a ballpoint pen and a piece of typing paper, and there she blows. It really it's just it's just so wild how powerful. <laughs> it's just like again, it just somehow like 
be, between the name, the clown, and the sound, it was just it clicked so hard. I guess uh, uh, like 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 cracks me up to this day. Whenever I see somebody <laughs> with that clown tattooed on their neck or their <laughs> whatever. Um, when d- w- was was there a, a a point? Because like uh, I I was talking to to. to to Pat Blaschel, who I've known for like like forever and ever, and and uh, and I, I I called him just to 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 get a little nerdy since he was there and he saw you guys. I wanted to get some some kind of like sense of 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 just how it felt to be around the Butthole Surfers and and when these how how these records felt as a fan of the band. And we both kind of talked about how Rembrandt Pussy Ghost has such a sound to it. Were you aware? Like, why does that sound different than the other ones? Is that a dumb question? <laughs> it just sounds. It's there's something different. Well, that was that was you know that was only our second full length LP, mm-hmm. and it, a lot of it was recorded at the same studio that we recorded the first LP <clears throat> and the right. first EP. Right. Um, the the only real difference was that uh, I think we mixed a lot of it at Kramer's Noise New York. Okay. And. And I think we even recorded a couple of the songs on it there at Noise New York. Oh, I was just going to say, we had a little well, more on, time Paul, to do sorry. a little more exper- experimentation than we did on the other stuff. And and that experimentation, I, I think, might be the difference you're talking about. I think w- one thing that was unique about the band early on is that uh, Paul and Gibby were more or less living <laughs> in a studio and, and could record in a nice studio when it wasn't being used. So it allowed them to be experimental for for a way which a band which had no record out <laughs> could, could do so like they were kind of learning the studio and coming up with songs in the studio and for a band that early in their career uh to 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 be wor- working up songs in the studio and treating the studio like its own instrument was really unique and it was it was mind-blowing it, it was so cool to to witness and be a part of um there, there's some other on the first rec on the first album on psyche perilous there were some songs that were written in the studio that we never played again, like Eye of the Chicken, I think, uh, a few others. But um, when it came to Rembrandt, there were a lot more tracks that were just recorded in the studio. And then we had to figure out later on, how do we even do this live? And uh, concerning that was like only our, our second album, uh, you know, that that was a really different time, for, like a really unusual uh place for a band to be in and you know i'm grateful for it the drum like, and that's when sam what kind of sampler were, were, were like like was samplings happening on there right on rembrandt isn't there somehow like like there's there's things or, or is it just or is it just using uh delay in a in a in a way for some reason when i heard that record i'd never heard anything that sounded like that like i'm thinking like american woman and stuff like that i don't know let's see the american woman I had kind of a distinctive drum sound, and I think that came from a a Lexicon PCM seventy reverb or a Yamaha SPX ninety. I don't remember, but those early digital reverbs that were affordable in the old days, they kind of had a sound to them, and, and we just thought it was amusing enough to just turn way up. Were any of these racks that you used on the record, or the, these rack effects, the same ones that Gibby would have on his rack live? Yeah, uh, Gibby's live rack had a a couple of rack delays that that were do longer delays, and then would have a sweep knob to where you could sweep from high to low without any steps in between. Right, right, right. And uh, you know, I I had the same thing on my guitar. So between Gibby and I both having these delays, we could get pretty you know freaked out with the sound. <laughs> And the, and and these were things that you found out about in the studio that, that that you started fucking with in the studio and then brought to the live thing. As far as like that, for example, that move. I don't even remember how we got involved with those things. When, when did the symbol with the flame start? Because I almost burned down my friend's house after I saw that because we were fucking around. <laughs> and, 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 and I, I swear to God, I remember, my my friend was actually the same guy Frank Longo had. He was like really handy, and he'd re- he'd like had, had the upstairs room of his parents' house. You know, he's like a whatever sophomore in high school or something like that. And he he had sanded the floors, and we were like, "Oh wow, we're rubbing alcohol, cool!" And so we're like, we're rubbing, we're putting it on our hands, and then 
it's just somehow at one point I kind of like dump it on the ground and then, or, you know, on these floors and then light it on fire. And then like, it's like, oh, we could do a little more. And then the next thing you know, the entire floor is covered in blue flame. And we're listening to butthole surfers and stuff. So I, I guess I've always wondered <laughs> how you guys came to <laughs> came to the came to the flame effect. You know that was that was all Gibby's doing, and I can't even remember <laughs> the very first time he did that. You know uh, whether that was before or after King joined the band. I kind of think it was after King joined, and uh, you know after King joined, you know that's when we started having a supply of broken symbols. You know. <laughs> I'm just so happy that uh, that we never, to my knowledge, burned down the club. I mean, we we totally lucked oh. out there. I mean, I mean, my gosh, <laughs> so lucky. We, we should have we, we we should have been stopped decades ago. <laughs> I I mean, for real. Somehow somehow we all, all managed to dodge a bullet there. You know, I'm, it's 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 good to hear you say that because again, this is that's this thing that I've always wondered is like, wait, how the fuck did they do all that? How we we became somewhat. <laughs> no, uh, no, there was enough notoriety with us to where when we would show up at clubs to play, the fire department would be waiting for us. And what would they say? <laughs> they would want to see how the fire symbol worked, and they'd want to see, you know, the pump shotgun that was going to be fired off several times during the show. And they'd look at this stuff and then just hand it right back to us and say, as you do. And I was always freaking amazed that the fire department would, you know, here's your shotgun bag. Feel free to blast it off as you see fit. Here, you know, here's your fire symbol bag. Don't worry about burning the club down. I'm sure it'll be fine. God almighty, we were lucky. I I, I read something, Paul, I don't know if you recall saying it, but I, 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 it rang true with me where he said that your interest in mayhem stopped at, at, at after a certain point. I think he said September 11th or something like that. But It the, was 9-11 did it for me. I really, I, I really, it, that that resonates with me too. It's like, 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 and and the the way that the buttholes that the buttholes servers were able to create this sense of mayhem, and you don't know what the fuck is going to happen next, except for that, I uh, except for that symbol is gonna, <laughs> that, that flaming symbol is probably going to happen, and you know, a shotgun or something like that. But other than that, you really don't know what's going to happen, and, and the was, I don't know. It set a it set a standard that for for like a kind of a crazy thing then that that i certainly don't want anymore as, a, as an adult <laughs> it was like, fun but it's you know a little goes a long way uh the, the 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 time period that we're talking about with these records um do, do, was it was it still rolling were, were you feeling the burn but at, at, at that point as far as kind of living in mayhem to such a to, to to such a degree, or was it, or, or were these records still kind of capturing? It's because they certainly sound like they're capturing like the spark and 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 the fun. Was it? Were these records made in fun d d while it was insanely fun? Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, and uh, the, you know, I, I I love nothing more than being in the studio. To me, being in the studio is a whole lot more fun than being on the road. You know, when you're playing live and traveling from town to town, you're kind of at the mercy of the winds. And when you're in the studio, you can you can control your environment and control what goes on, and you're in charge. But once you step outside the studio, you're not in charge anymore. So I, I always like the studio. Did you all um, f feel that like what, when you're making these records, were you like, fuck yes, this is this is exciting. Like, this is really, really fun. Like, what, what was that from from the jump? Was the studio experience a fun place to be? Yeah, it, you know, the very early on, I was just amazed that we could be in the studio at all. It's like yeah, being all, in the yeah. studio is what rock stars do. So we're rock stars now. And and then by the time we got into uh, Rembrandt Pussy Horse and we were able to do experiment experiments and, and things like that in the studio, that that was a whole lot of fun. And that that's to me, I, I just live to be in a situation where I can make something different in a studio. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Of course, of course, we were rock stars in the sense that we were sleeping on the floor. We had no home. We, we had no jobs. We had no girlfriends, no boyfriends. Uh, we had few friends. We had very few possessions other than what we could fit in the van. But because we were traveling, because we were putting out music, because we were doing what we wanted to do and still washing dishes, like I think we all were doing before we said, oh, fuck it, let's just be a band full time. Th that to us was like, okay, success. We're, we're, we're a band. We're touring. We're doing our thing. Right. And right. I was having a blast. I mean, I, 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 before I joined the Buttle Surface, I never left the state of Texas before. 
So here I was like with my favorite band playing music, touring, you know, touring the country and hanging out with guys who were cracking me up. It's like, okay, this is the best. Now screw it that none of us have money. Screw us that screw it that that if we if you get sick, you just have to play, you know, sick and you can't afford to see a doctor. This was a blast. It was it was so much fun. Of course, we were, you know, we were in our 20s or whatever, so uh, I don't know if I'd want, want to do it again, but for the time it was great. It was fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the the momentum that you guys had and that sense of fun was also, you know, re, was was very clear as as it was happening because I you know, I mean, I remember like I I knew that you guys were coming to town and sort of setting up or just being there. Like like what was it like coming to New York and just you're in New York all of a sudden Kramer is working with you guys and you, where are you staying? Uh, we stayed at uh, a friend's house on Houston street, um, the corner of Mott and Houston. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we had a, a practice space that was like three stories below ground in some building that had been used as a civil war jail on Mott street. Is that right? Yeah, yeah man. Yeah, I think that's the same one as the Beastie Boys ended up using. I could be wrong, but I I, I might not be. Yeah. It would it wouldn't surprise me. And and then you know we had like a a budget. Every band member got three dollars a day to to <laughs> buy food and beer. And so the you know back in the eighties, a dollar would buy you a beer, or a dollar would buy you a slice of pizza. So three dollars meant two beers and one slice, or two slices and one beer. And so we were always about the two beers. And then you're going. Are, are you recording at Kramer's when you're staying in New York? Well, we, we definitely we, we definitely recorded some at Kramer's, but we also mixed some as well. So, you know, you were, you were talking about American Woman. We, we recorded that in San Antonio, and we, we had the tapes with us. So, like in our van, we were carrying all these tapes, and we you know, we we had we had guitars and amps and drums and our you know, but we also had all these tapes, including unfinished tapes that we recorded in San Antonio. That that we mixed uh, at at Kramer's place, and as as far as American Woman goes, I know at the time we were fascinated with well, like uh, the 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 hip hop scene, like just the huge drums, uh, and like like even like like Run DMC or whatever, like these huge sounding drums. So I think that was kind of like our attempt in a way to try to be cool, <laughs> have these cool sounding like hip sounding drums. But I mean, really, it was just kind of taking like what we're hearing in New, in New York. From the streets in New York, it's like wow, this is so cool. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Um, did, what was it? What were your feelings about uh, Kramer at the time? You know, like like the having this guy. Did, did, were you were you familiar with his work? Were you? Uh, how did he come into the fold? We were big fans of Shockabilly, and uh, Shockabilly would come through Austin from time to time, and we'd always be there. And uh, I think they even spent the night at Gibby's parents' house in Dallas one night. Oh, gotcha. And so we we knew those guys. And what did Kramer did did did, did do you recall Kramer like being like, oh cool, I'm learning something from Kramer because he's in Shockabilly and he's did, did what, was he part of your learning process of making records and stuff? Did he make an impact? Oh yeah, I mean, we hadn't learned heart very much at all by that point, and there we are in a studio, and Kramer had like an actual engineer working for him. You know, when we recorded in San Antonio. Our engineer had to spend an hour looking, reading the manual for the board to figure out how to work a <laughs> board, and uh, and then we were left to figure it out on ourselves. But in at Noise New York, there was an actual in-house engineer, and we got to watch him create a fade out at the end of American Woman by recording uh, piece after piece in a slightly lower volume, and then piecing piecing it all together with a razor blade and tape. And you know, they, we learned all kind of neat stuff about analog and then all that stuff just went out the window when digital came along <laughs> you're like tape fuck that <laughs> kramer was a total guardian angel to, to a large degree because one you know we need a studio he's like well kramer cord at my studio then we need a, a, a bass player it's like well i'll be your bass player we, ex- we expressed a slight interest in going to europe someday it's like well like let's I'll, I'll, i know people in europe let's book a tour so the first time we went to Europe was really due, due to Kramer, and he was our bass player. But oh, wow. invariably, when we'd show up to play it was more like and, and, we, we were Kramer's band, really. Ah, was, yeah. he, he wasn't our bass because, player, like, we the, were the, his the, band. The, 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 flyer, the, 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 the flyers would say, Buttle Surfers, but then below it would be X Shockabilly. 
or sometimes just shockabilly. You know, like and like, oh, you're not shockabilly, well, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, we we were totally riding the shockabilly train in Europe. <laughs> incredible, incredible. That's cool. Uh, um, I am okay. So you know, like I'm a fan and stuff, but I did not know about the kung fu scene until i read this piece in the san antonio uh paper so can you tell the audience a bit about the about what you told jello biafra about the kung fu scene in san antonio well we we told everybody about the kung fu scene in san antonio you know and there wasn't a scene of any kind at all in san antonio so we just kind of made one up and we and uh, we called it Kung Fu, and we invented all these bands that would play in the Kung Fu scene. You know, there was the Ridiculoids and uh, just the stupidest names in the world. And then we invented a, a venue, which is the actual real pharmacy down the street from where I grew up, called Aldous Pharmacy. And we would tell people that on Tuesday nights they'd have Kung Fu shows. They'd wheel away the racks of the hearing aids and then bring on bands like the Ridiculoids and. And whenever the Ridiculoids played, somebody would turn up dead. So the Rick Ridiculoids would stop advertising their shows because they didn't want any more people to die. And then people found out they'd missed the Ridiculoids and would kill themselves. And I mean, the, the stupidest stories in the world that you can imagine. And uh, we always assumed that people knew we were just joking. And, you know, and we'd start talking about wanting to assemble a Kung Fu compilation, you know, with all these great bands from San Antonio that we could put together on a compilation. And I think Ruth Schwartz from uh, uh, More Damn Records or whatever it was called, she she got interested and wanted to do it. And because and we she used to put us up at her house and she was just super great to us. And then she found out one night that we were just joking and she she got really mad at us. And, and it was upsetting because I thought she knew we were joking and there was no way to tell her, hey, you know, we, we weren't trying to deceive you or it was just us being really stupid and my my uh, favorite pair of bands from from the kung fu scene were these two rival bands uh one were called the Againsters, who were just against everything and then the rivals were the Againsters, who just played the same song over and over again so yeah those <laughs> those two bands did not get along so it was Againsters versus Againsters. <laughs> So now, yeah, and, and then there was there was there was Hitler missed, and the controversy was: <laughs> is this Hitler being missed by somebody that misses Hitler, or is it Hitler that just missed the mark? You know, it's, it's all, all just spectacularly stupid. So now I, I'm there's I, I have this tape here because I'm at the Matador offices, and there there appears to be a compilation of the that did you ever record did you start recording this thing did did you ever do any recording of these imaginary bands or am i just look am i looking at something that's mislabeled oh i, I think at that point when we were recording in the studio we might have just written whatever we wanted on the tape sleeves and so we might have put kung fu compilation or i see i see i see okay, okay. i'm not really sure how that went down Okay, so 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 there is no you, you guys never did start a kung fu compilation of imaginary bands that you guys were it, were pretending to be. Does, that, no, it's something I'd I'd still kind of like to do though. I would love that. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think that would be... I pulled out the the original multi track recordings from uh, Psychic Powers, Another Man's Sack, and Rembrandt Pussy Horse, and um, I'm I'm remixing them. Uh, portions of them right now just documenting what i have and there's like five or six songs that are completely finished recording that never made it out and i was like why didn't we release this stuff and and so i'm I'm looking forward to some new new unreleased material coming out of that that's fucking insanely exciting news that's really really cool i have a couple of other questions scratch acid did y'all play with them a lot oh yeah oh. they were buddies it, awesome um what was there? Did did you guys? Was, did you take any inspiration from? Were, were were you guys feeding off of each other? Was it just like love you guys? I know that you know. I went out and traded my beautiful vintage blonde, nineteen sixty two Fender blonde amp for a a more modern black Fender concert amp because that's what Brett Bradford played was a Fender concert, and I love the way he sounded, and I wanted to sound like Brett Bradford. And, cool. and I, I never did, of course, but I tried. <laughs> that's cool well i also, also want to want to backtrack a bit you know you're, you're talking about what early influences 
the band had. And you know, Paul was talk, talking about meat puppets and I said chrome. But also bigger picture was that just the the, the bands from Texas, uh, there, there were so few bands, we all just kind of rubbed off on each other. And we had some amazing bands. Uh, you know, you, you had the blues of the Dicks. You you had the, the performance uh, aspect of, of the big boys. You had just the the drudgery noise and slowness of Stigma the Ray Guns. And like and 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 these were the bands we saw the most because at the time it was really hard for a band from California or DC or whatever to come to Texas. So the, these these amazing Texas bands we would see over and over again. And to a large degree, I think we kind of well, I think. The, the performance aspect, the Buttles probably got a lot from, say, the Big Boys and, and the Dicks. Uh, we we want to put on a show, and um, and all those bands were, were so uh, unusual f- from from the typical hardcore bands going on in the rest of, of the of the nation. And I think these Texas bands were all kind of like feeding off each other. And certainly, uh, when you have a band like Scratch Acid, uh, you know they they were friends, and they were they were doing the same kind of. Uh, music territories we were as far as like playing punk rock but not really playing punk rock and i think we totally got them and, and vice versa i just want to interject about the stickman with ray guns because seeing them you know everybody else was pretty much fun to watch but the stickman with ray guns were terrifying i mean i can remember wa- watching bobby stocks on stage and somebody you know in the crowd pissing him off and so him you know, getting pissed off back and, and saying, come on, I'll take all you motherfuckers on. And when they start to come towards the stage, watch him pick up a mic stand and swing it like he's going to kill people. And then the crowd gets back. And, <laughs> and, then, and then seeing him, you know, in Voltaire's basement where he's got a, a girlfriend clawing at his crotch the whole set until finally he allows her to suck on his flaccid weenie for a few seconds and just stuff like that, which... I've never seen anybody do, and these people were for real. This was this was not contrived stuff. These people were scary because they were scary. Yeah. Um, cottage cheese from the lips of death. Did you guys have something to do with putting that together? Yeah, I think we had everything to do with putting that together. That again, that's a, weirdly a record that somehow made it out to New Jersey, <laughs> and I was like, "What the fuck is this?" It was so exciting. And I think, in a way, that's somehow how I first got to 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 meet the Buttle Surfers because I was given a flyer by giving a Paul of like, "Hey, come to San Antonio, record for this album we're putting together of Texas hardcore." So the Hugh Obama experience got that flyer. We're like, "Uh, sure, we'll come to San Antonio." And that's that was my first time in the same studio where the Buttholes were recording, recorded, uh, you know, the records we're talking about, and where I got to got to meet them and uh, really I hang out with them. And that was really Gibby and Paul's, and also the the owner of the studios, I guess, idea to, to make to make a compilation record, all recorded in the same studio in San Antonio. But they they got all the they invited all the bands throughout Texas to come and record that. So, you know, hats off to Gibby Paul and I guess Bob O'Neill, I guess, for making that happen. I'd love the artwork on that too. Did you did did you all do the? You, you must have done the artwork, right? The, those I think give me uh, I'm trying to remember which one was that the one with the ants it had squares of of and little images inside the squares as I it's it is, is what I'm remembering and I'm sure that was Gibby. It, it's absolutely yeah. Gibby watercolors yeah it's, it's Gibby yeah 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 and yeah. yeah. um, what was the deal with that band watchtower wasn't there like a, 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 a and this is just like, like they like what I remember there's kind of a metal band on there. Am I am I right? I think about they that? were really, really young kids in a metal band. They were I, I remember S- San Ant- S- like San Antonio metal. San Antonio was always was always was always like a a, a haven for metal. And no doubt. they they were one they were one of the best metal bands in Texas and they were from San Antonio and they were kids. It was fucking it was so cool. That 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 music on that compilation also really was exciting. You know what I mean? Because you, you got the sense of just the breadth of, of, of what was going on down there. And, and uh, I thought that record was so fucking cool. Um, so I'm, I'm th- thanks for putting that. <laughs> thanks for putting that together. Um, uh, King, the, 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 the the thing the 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 idea of of a band that could only be from from texas and and the idea of making 
or and and Paul, you're talking about how nothing was going on, so you had to make something going on. It kind of sucked, and you were trying to do do something to 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 get out. But the 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 void of the lack of anything to do is also kind of part of it. Is it, it's is that is that part of a Texas sound? That's probably true, but I still have trouble kind of identifying it. You know, the Texas sound part of it but right i mean i don't know if there's a sound but just a feeling i suppose more if, if i may like like at that point in time texas was so isolated that really all we could really kind of draw on was was amongst our peers to a large degree but then you have some things that that made sense to a texan like say the blues and country music and things that we would hear more than say a kid like in new york might not hear or or wherever and i think i think it all kind of comes I mean, I, I hear in Paul's guitar playing. I mean, you know, pa, you know, Paul and Gibby were, were always big fans of, say, Freddie King, for instance. And uh, and and unlike most bands at the time, Paul could actually play Freddie King lit. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, the the vibrato and stuff. Yeah, like um, when when you wrote the song Gary Floyd, what what was the idea? Like, we just got to write a song about Gary Floyd because he's awesome. Not at all. You know. <laughs> I came up with a chord progression, and uh, in practice, um, Gibby wouldn't sing on it. So I, I would just go up to the mic and start yelling stuff, and then people would say, what were you singing about? I thought I heard you singing about Gary Floyd. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm singing about Gary Floyd. <laughs> and was Gary happy about that? He's, uh, he's <laughs> said that he is. <laughs> We love Gary Floyd, you know, and I've loved everything Gary Floyd ever did in music, you know, from Greatest the Dicks to Sister Double Happiness. Okay, oh, he's just just a wonderful, you know, ambassador for the state of Texas. Even though he moved to San Francisco, sold you guys out. <laughs> yeah, but I don't blame him. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, better fit for him, I guess. That's I. I, I think I'm good. <laughs> Um, it's, I'm, I'm, I, I, and, and really, you know, I, I just got to say, I'm such a fan that I still am a little starstruck. Um, be, uh, be, be, because y'all, y'all saw you guys play. It always lot. cracks me up because whenever tells, whenever someone tells me they're a fan of the band, I don't believe them. I think you're fucking lying, dude. I was fucking there, man. <laughs> I was there a lot, and and also I, 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 I should say, I feel like a ding dong. But the 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 kid who's selling your t-shirts in the late 80s was always really nice to me and my friends and he would get us in to shows and stuff like that he would actually put us on the on on, on y'all's guest list and stuff because we were always significant i felt significantly younger than than that whatever we were underage you know and 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 uh and it was so you know i saw you guys at cbgb's i remember seeing gibby being like like recognizing our little crew of friends be like oh and like we were sitting up on stage because it was so fucking packed this one show and he was like, "Hey guys, you know." And we were like, "Oh, okay, okay. it's okay. For, it's okay that we're sitting here up on stage." He's like, "Yeah, yeah, that's cool." And then somebody else was like leaning on his rack, and he kept on telling that, that who wasn't with my crew, and kept on telling that guy to to not lean on the rack. And then finally, he just like grabbed the guy's face and shoved him into the crowd. And I just remember being like, "Okay, well, they're nice to us, but they're definitely not fucking around here," <laughs> you know? Like, um, so I mean, I don't know. I could just go on and on. So. I'm a really, really big fan, and uh, and thanks for making these records, and thanks for 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 uh, thanks for letting Matador reissue them because I think that I I I feel like a lot of people are going to hear them for the first time and have their minds blown because they really they sound beautiful, you know. We're so, we're super excited to be a part of the Matador family. I just just pinch myself. It's so cool. It's so cool. I was I, I mean, like like when I found out that this was happening, I was like, Oh my god, you know, because and, and again also like I mean, just for what it's worth, this guy Frank Longo ended up being like one of the art art guys at Matador Records, like in the nineties and stuff like that. So it's just like there's just always been a really big uh love for you guys, uh, among me and my peers. So thanks for showing up and doing this and uh I hope uh, I hope that y'all put out some of those unreleased songs. That would be fucking amazing. Are there any type? Can can you maybe get, throw a title out there of 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 of, <laughs> of an unreleased song? There was one uh, called uh, "Stupid Ugly Face," <laughs> and uh, the other ones I I can't remember the names of, but you know I can remember like looking at the names written in the the track listing and, and not having any idea what they were. And I don't remember even doing them. It's like, God, why did we leave that off? It's really pretty good. Thanks King. And thanks Paul. Cheers. Thank you. Had a good time. Appreciate it.